Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today uh, for this webinar presented by Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman in partnership with the Behavioral Science and Policy Association. This is our seventh and penultimate webinar of this academic year. Uh, my name is Patrick Rooney, and I'm a second-year PhD in strategy here at Rotman, the Fair Research Coordinator and the moderator for today's webinar. Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman, or FAIR, is a research center at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, whose three programmatic missions are to research, educate, and engage in meaningful outreach with our academic, governmental, and industry partners. These monthly webinars are our way to hear firsthand from academics and practitioners who are making a meaningful impact in the world of behavioral insights, in particular, behaviorally informed business and evidence-based public policy. That being said, uh, we are delighted today to have Lisa Kramer, Professor of Finance here at Rotman and a Fair Research Fellow, uh, who will be talking to us today about how emotions influence financial markets. Uh, before I formally introduce Lisa, I want to go over the ground rules for the webinar. Uh, following this introduction, our speaker will deliver a 35-minute presentation. During the presentation, please submit questions for our speaker by clicking the chat tab at the top right of your WebEx screen and typing into the entry box. These questions will be visible to all of the participants. At the end of the talk and with time permitting, we will have a question and answer session in which I will select questions from the chat tab to ask our speaker. As a side note, please only use the Q&A tab for WebEx connectivity issues and send these Q&As privately to Liz Kang, who's our WebEx technical guru. Uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Kramer. Routinely stirring up controversy with her seminal contributions, bridging the gap between relational fi irrational finance and behavioral finance, Professor Lisa Kramer is no stranger to the dynamic marketplace of ideas. She's an expert on behavioral economics, behavioral finance, investments, capital market seasonality, neuroeconomics, and personal finance. Her research has been published in peer-reviewed journals in finance, economics, and psychology, and has been profiled in popular press outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Business, Money, U.S. News and World Reports, The Washington Post, The Daily Telegraph, and other outlets. Uh, she received her Ph.D. in Finance from the Sauter School of Business at the University of British Columbia and is a professor of finance here at the University of Toronto. She previously held the Canadian Securities Institute Research Foundation term professorship and has spent sabbaticals as a visiting scholar at the Psychology Department at Stanford University and at the Rady School of Management at the University of California, San Diego. She tweets about behavioral finance and a wide range of other topics as at Lisa Kramer. Uh, with that, thanks, Lisa, for being here today, and take it away. Thanks for that introduction, Patrick. It's really wonderful to be here today. Welcome to everybody, and uh, thanks for, for joining me here in Toronto virtually. So I'll be talking about the way emotions influence financial markets, building a constellation of evidence. And I want to acknowledge the work of my collaborators with whom I did a lot of the research that I'll be discussing today. And I also want to acknowledge generous funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, without whom this work would not have been possible. So most of you tuning in will already know a lot about behavioral finance, and I don't want to dwell on that kind of general introduction too much, but just as a Quick warm up, let's just acknowledge that behavioral finance draws on insights from a range of fields, including psychology, biology, neuroscience, medicine, sociology, of course, economics and finance themselves to help us understand a whole range of topics uh, that are very practical and observed out there in the world. So hurting fads and bubbles, of course, um, you know, we think about what's going on with cryptocurrencies and uh, lots of things like that. Uh, present bias and the way that human tendency contributes to people's lack of preparedness for retirement. And I would note that the organizers at Bear are very well versed with, with behavioral phenomena like this one and probably exploit it when inviting people like me to give talks because they ask us months and months in advance when we think, oh, in April, my, my calendar will be so clear. And we say, yes, yes. And then, of course, April comes. And if they'd asked us yesterday, 
uh, we might have been less likely to participate. So BEAR is onto these things. Uh, anchoring is another phenomenon where arbitrary numbers unrelated to the decision at hand can contribute to the ways in which people make decisions. Uh, the endowment effect, I'll have a little bit more to say about the endowment effect in a few moments, but um, how starting conditions uh, can influence financial and other economic decisions. Today we're going to drill in on the particular influence of emotions and the way emotions influence financial decision making. And this has been at the heart of the work that I do. And in classical finance, the sort of training that people like me received, you know, a couple of decades ago in business schools, there really wasn't any role for emotions to play in decision making. And so the models that, that people like me learned about, and which were very standard at the time, didn't have any role for emotions or anything really other than, than wealth and the way wealth varies. So very simple models were mathematically tractable, but didn't do a great job explaining how people actually make decisions. And so things have evolved since then. We know from a lot of work in psychology that emotions are actually really important in decision making overall. And we've come to understand it influences financial decision making as well. And we're coming to see the sort of formal ways in which emotions can play a role in things we just talked about on the last slide, like hurting market crashes and bubbles, but also things you may not realize emotions play a role in, like the endowment effect. And I'll talk a bit more about the endowment effect in a moment. But first, let me just say, there's sort of this widespread uh, belief that that behavioral finance in general and the role of emotions in particular in decision making is a hallmark of irrationality. And I just want to say that's not necessarily the case. So in principle, you could have emotions playing a role in the way investors make decisions in a way that's irrational. But you could also find that emotions come up and influence decision making without any mistakes or irrationality coming into play. And I feel that my work has really helped to bridge the, the gap between these two extremes. Um, you know, most work has sort of, most work in behavioral economics and behavioral finance has, has highlighted the mistake aspect. Um, my work is really more in a kind of rational theme, and um, we'll see kind of how those two kind of come together. So back to um, the idea of the endowment effect. So emotions play a role, as I'll discuss today, both in decisions at the individual level and sort of aggregate up to affect markets overall. And the endowment effect is a, a great gateway to discuss how it is that emotions play a role in individual decision-making. So most of us have sort of heard of the endowment effect, but just for those who may not have heard of it, this effect was shown in a lab setting using mugs as a bit of a prop. So you'll recall that with the endowment effect, people set their selling price for an object much higher than their buying price. So in the lab, people came into a room and they saw a mug, and they were asked, how much would you be willing to pay for this mug? And people said, I don't know, maybe a dollar. And then they were told, the, the mug is yours to keep, actually. It's your mug. Have a cup of coffee in it. Enjoy it. Recognize what a great mug it is. And then they were asked, how much would somebody have to pay you to be willing to part with this mug? All of a sudden, the price of the mug went up to you know, maybe $3. This is the endowment effect. And the reason I mention it now in the context of emotions is because Jennifer Lerner and co-authors did a study that came out in Psychological Science in 2004 where they examined the way in which emotions could interfere or um, highlight or even eliminate the endowment effect. And just a couple of things they did, for example, they induced feelings of sadness among participants in these lab studies. And they found when they did that, the endowment effect reversed. So all of a sudden, the buy price rose and the sell price dropped. And so we actually had the endowment effect in reverse. And they also induced feelings of disgust. And when they induced feelings of disgust by having people watch disgusting scenes from films, the endowment effect completely disappeared. So the buy price and the sell price became equal. So this is a way in which emotions play a role in individual decisions. 
We're also interested in the overall aggregate markets. What happens when lots of people are influenced by emotions and markets do their thing? Um, some work has looked at this. Hirschleifer and Shumway had a paper in 2003 that found on sunny days in New York City, for example, stock returns tended to be higher than they were on cloudy days. Um, Alec Edmonds and co-authors found that looking at sports tournaments around the world, um, when a country's sporting team in, say, the World Cup had a, a win in a, in a large tournament, the stock market went up the following trading day. In my own work, looking at stock markets and seasonality in mood through the seasons, we found in the seasons when a fraction of the population experiences seasonal affective disorder that stock markets responded. Basically, we see um, in the fall, people become less willing to hold risk, and they don't become more willing to resume their holdings of risk until sort of the, the sunnier seasons, and this has market influences on prices and returns. And I'm going to drill into this particular study a little bit um, to dive more into the way emotions play a role in markets. So I'm doing this as part of an attempt to build what we're calling a constellation of evidence. So I'll tell you a bit about this finding in stock markets, and then I will add to that a series of studies we did in other facets of financial markets, and even a study that we did in a more experimental setting on individuals to build this kind of collection of evidence that is a bit different than just kind of a one-off finding in, in one facet of markets. If we can find corroborative evidence in other aspects of markets, this might help fortify um, the, the support for the hypothesis underlying the, the research agenda. So let's start with that study on, on stock markets. And I'll just give you a bit of background. So lots of serious market crashes have happened in the fall, going back to you know the sort of starting point of the Great Depression, uh, what happened in the late 80s, um, more recently with the start of the financial crisis. These events tend to get started in the fall. And even um, going back more than a century, bankers noticed that bank runs tended to happen every few years, and these would typically happen in the fall. And this is actually, um, a lot of people don't know this, but this was actually one of the big reasons that the U.S. Federal Reserve System was founded to try to um, stop these seasonal bank runs. And, you know, there are certainly big economic triggers that can lead to these kinds of things happening. Um, any time of year, and maybe these economic events are more likely to happen in the fall, but we want to explore whether there's a psychological reason that might also contribute. Maybe when economic conditions are ripe, and it happens to be a time of year when people are experiencing certain emotions, that might lead to a bit of a, a cascade or some momentum in this event happening. So to explore this, we recognize uh, but leaning, uh, leaning on results from psychology, that about 10% of the population suffers from severe depression in the fall and winter, known as seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. And it seems to be due to diminished daylight through the darker seasons of the year. Medical researchers, psychologists, and psychiatrists have studied the range of potential economic or environmental um, stimulus that could could lead to these sorts of mood effects, and they've isolated daylight um, as being kind of the biggest cause. And the sorts of things that happen to people who suffer from SAD include depression and a range of other symptoms. Uh, it's depression that we're most interested in for this particular study because it's, you know, a very marked influence on mood. The effect influences all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life when it occurs, and it's a serious medical condition. It's not just some imaginary phenomenon. And even if we don't suffer from severe depression, most people actually experience some degree of mood variation through these seasons. They, come a, they become a little bit blue. And if we take a look at hours of night through the, through, uh, the course of the year, this particular graph shows us hours of night on the vertical axis and months of the year along the horizontal axis, starting with September. 
and these different um, curves show us the, the oscillation of light of darkness through the year. So starting with this one that I've highlighted here, this is the hours of night in the US. And it's going to be very similar in parts of Canada where most Canadians live. And we see sort of starting in September, the hours of, of darkness are a little below 11. They, they go all the way up to a high around 15. And they kind of follow a bit of a sine wave through the year. In countries that are a little further away from the equator, like um, Germany, which is highlighted here, um, the variation is going to be more extreme. And in Sweden, of course, in the winter, it is very, very dark. Uh, more than 18 hours of night is what they experience. And then in the southern hemisphere, we see kind of the opposite seasonal patterns and a little bit less extreme variation. This is um, something that is well known to anybody who lives anywhere other than the equator. In Sweden, they have to deal with this extreme darkness um, you know, to a much greater extent than in other countries. And so these light cafes have, have emerged in places like Sweden so that in the winter, people can congregate, have a little bit of socialization, and importantly, some light exposure. But you know, we want to think about whether these, these kinds of variations in our mood might have an effect on markets. And so the hypothesis underlying our work is that if there's seasonality in mood, which we know there is from the medical evidence, this could lead to seasonality in risk aversion. Now, this is something that's been studied in the psychology literature. There is a link between depression and risk aversion. And I'll talk about some work I've done that has contributed to the documentation of this link. Um, now, given that link, we could see seasonality in financial markets emerge because we know the decision to buy stocks or sell stocks or choose stocks over bonds is driven fundamentally by our preference to hold risk. And if that preference is changing seasonally, that could lead to widespread variation in people's choice to hold different assets, the prices they're willing to pay to buy and sell those assets. And this is the heart and soul of what we're examining in this research agenda. So we studied that question for the first time in a paper that came out in the 2003 in the American Economic Review, and we've returned to the question in other works, but we're studying stock markets around the world. And what we find is during the seasons, fall and winter, when investors are more depressed or experiencing winter blues and therefore more, more risk averse, they need a higher reward for holding risky stock. Some of you may know this as the equity premium or the equity risk premium. That, that quantity is going to be bigger in the seasons when investors are more risk averse. That effect is going to be bigger at higher latitudes like Sweden, where that darkness is more severe um, and longer lasting. And the effects that we find in markets are going to be offset by six months in those countries south of the equator where the seasons are offset by six months. And the seasonality that, that we have documented in returns that I've just outlined, it implies that just like risk aversion varies through the seasons with investors, investors are going to be more reluctant to hold risky assets like stock in the fall. And then in sort of the, the late winter and spring, when their mood rebounds, so rebounds their willingness to hold these risky assets. And this is something that we documented in a range of countries. So, um, just some technical background for those who are interested in kind of the, the underbelly to this kind of work. We, we did um, conduct this work leaning on evidence from the psychology and psychiatry literature. We actually compiled statistics from um, psychiatric and psychological studies that documented the timing at which patients first experienced their depression symptoms and the, the time of year at which they recovered. We used that to build a variable uh, that allowed us to model the timing of these symptoms, particularly uh, these, these couple of studies that I, I'm uh, highlighting right here. These are great studies that really facilitated work in finance. I mean, it's so interesting that we would sort of stand on the shoulder of giants leaning on medical research to conduct research in finance. And we used this, this variable that we build as, as uh, an explanatory variable in the empirical models that we built to test these kinds of effects. So just uh, kind of generally to, 
um, give you a synopsis of the findings, lots of different countries we looked at. Those at kind of high latitudes, like 50 degrees north and higher, had the strongest effects. Those at a more moderate uh, latitude had more moderate effects. And those in the equatorial regions really didn't have effects at all. So the higher the latitude, the stronger these effects in stock markets. And that was all well and good. Um, you know, that there's this, this pattern in markets. In the autumn, there's reduced demand for risk. And in the spring, uh, demand rebounds. Um, very consistent with this kind of old market adage, sell in May, then go away. You know, it's consistent with the idea that emotions influence markets. But some people were still a little skeptical, like, hmm, this seems like correlation. Is it really causation? And that really uh, inspired my co-authors and, and myself to go out there and look for other ways in which we could test this hypothesis to try to build a constellation of evidence, looking to other places to see if we can test this hypothesis and refute it or find more evidence that's consistent with the underlying mood influencing markets hypothesis. And so that's what I want to give you a little sense of next. Just in the next few minutes, I'll go through a few additional studies that helped us build that constellation of evidence. So first, uh, the next place we turned was the market for safe securities. We see what's happening in the very risky end of markets. What's happening if we look at US Treasury returns where, you know, this is really considered kind of the safest option for investors in the whole menu of financial securities that exist. So in this study in 2015, we looked at U.S. Treasury bond returns, and basically what we found was the opposite pattern. So in the fall, when investors are shunning risky, shunning risky assets, they're favoring these safe um, U.S. Treasury bonds. And then everything flips again in the spring. And, you know, I don't want to get into the technicalities of asset pricing models, but this is a bit surprising relative to the models that, that we've been working with in kind of classical finance. Um, yet there's nothing irrational about the finding. All you need is for people's preferences for risk to vary seasonally. Their demand for different kinds of assets depends on their emotions. So as people have their preferences changing through the years, or through, through the, the months of the year uh, driven by emotions, so change their choices about which assets to hold, and so change the rates of return on these assets. And we had to control for a whole range of known factors uh, that already are documented to influence treasury markets. So controlling for all of these things, um, some individually, some all at the same time, we found that the findings were very robust to these these additional uh, regularities. So it was a um, computationally intensive exercise with like 200 page appendices to some of these papers. And so turning uh, to another topic, shifting gears, you know, we've seen the effects in stock markets and we've seen the effects in the other extremum of the risk spectrum, uh, treasury bond markets. Next, we want to think about the underlying preferences that sort of are built into these hypotheses. We're finding these effects in overall markets. Is this really all arising due to the, the preferences of individual investors? So we decided to do a natural experiment um, using uh, participants from a large American uh, university's employee base. We had them voluntarily participate in our study over three points in time that took place over the course of, year of, of a year. Um, a few hundred of them took part in all three waves and allowed us to do some very interesting analysis. Um, they gave us a lot of information about them as people, uh, and they filled out some psychometric uh, questionnaires for us that allowed us to measure their levels of depression, uh, their emotions in general, their personality traits, and whether they suffered from seasonal affective disorder. They also got to make a choice in a way that allowed us to capture their financial risk aversion. So they could take, at each of these three waves, after filling out the survey, they could choose to take their $20 payment. For sure, we would just give them $20. Or they could invest it in something that offered a risky return. Um, so if they invested all of their $20, they sort of faced 50-50 odds of getting $0 or getting $42. So a pretty healthy rate of return if they invested 
Um, and what we didn't recognize when we started the study is that we were about to go into the deepest financial crisis observed in decades, and this complicated analysis considerably. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you a bit about what we found. So as I said, everybody got $20, and they could choose to invest this in increments of $2. So they could take either the whole $20, or they could invest $2 chunks of it up to the entire $20 in this investment opportunity. And so if they invested 100%, as I mentioned, they'd get either $0 or $42. If they invested half of it and took the other half as a safe $10, then their final payoff would be either $10 if they had bad luck or $31 if they had good luck and so on. They could um, invest none of their fee and take the $20 and so on. Now, what we measured, as I mentioned, is how depressed they are. And we can see that if we look at the people who scored as suffering from seasonal depression, which is about 10% of the, the group that participated, you'll see on the horizontal axis their score on a depression questionnaire we gave them. And so the top set of observations marked in blue is the people who suffer from SAD. And you can see in the first wave in the summer, they had a score that qualified them as being depressed. Even though it wasn't winter, they, they did on average still suffer from depression. In the second wave in the winter, they became more depressed. This is their sad in action. And then in the third wave, the second summer, they reverted back to their previous level of depression. So that's the influence of seasonal affective disorder on that group. In the non-seasonal affective disorder group, which is the red curve, um, those individuals, they had much lower levels of depression at all points in time. Um, nevertheless, their level of depression did go up a little bit in the winter, not enough to really qualify them as being depressed. Um, the next thing we're interested in is how much risk did they take? So we've got a measure here on the vertical axis. We've got a measure of what percent of their $20 did they take as a safe investment? Um, so how much did they not put into that risky investment? And so the higher the, the score on this vertical axis, the more risk averse they are. And again, the individuals who suffer from seasonal affective disorder are shown in blue. They are more risk averse at all times of the year. And those who do not suffer from seasonal affective disorder are shown in red. At all times in the year, they're making riskier choices. And we see that um, there's not a big difference between them in the first wave, so summer one, and we see that in the winter, the SAD group becomes um, much more risk averse, choosing the safe option much more frequently. And in the third wave, by this time, the financial crisis was completely out of control. So while we expected to see those uh, scores come back down, um, what do you know? It's not only emotions that influence financial willingness to take risk, but also macroeconomic phenomena, like what is going on in the stock market. So this is a bit of an unintended consequence of our study to see two things influencing risky choices at once. Uh, so definitely, uh, when you're out there doing experiments in the real world, lots of unexpected things can happen, and it's definitely not a controlled study. But um, these are the side effects of trying to do real work, uh, kind of real world research. And just to give you some background on what was going on in the markets, here we have the level of the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index over a period of time, starting uh, in January 27, going all the way to January 2009. You can see that first red circle is the first wave of our study. This was um, the summer of 2008 when markets were already um, off a bit. They were they had already gone down about 20% from their high the year before. So you know the, the conditions were already getting a little bit uh, concerning. Uh, by our second wave, which is the second dot, that's um, the winter uh, spanning 2008-2009 the market was actually down 40%. And um, so, you know, choices people were making at that point were being influenced not only by behavioral considerations like daylight, but also what was going on in markets. And then the third dot there is uh, the third wave of the study, and the market was still really um, in the doghouse. And so we see uh, 
the confounds of trying to do real, real, world, real world research. But nevertheless, this was perhaps the first test of an individual level psychological mechanism like an emotion influencing the overall financial markets. And uh, I think we were successful in, in that regard. They do support the view that time varying emotions uh, can lead to seasonality in, in risk aversion and the real choices people make about financial assets. So that was also a success marker of the study. Um, you know, we, they don't really tell us anything about whether those choices are rational or irrational. But um, they, they do tell us, you know, something about the hypothesis we were aiming to study. And they definitely show us that real world experiments can be exceedingly messy, um, which was also interesting. Okay, and shifting gears just to the last study I want to tell you about uh, today, looking at how emotions play a role in the mutual fund world. So mutual funds are a big conduit for individual investors to um, to hold securities and um, you know delay consumption and earn a rate of return on their savings. And most households have some kind of holdings in mutual funds um, in in uh, the U.S. And so we're kind of diving into that market here in a study where we're looking at the movement of investment funds into mutual funds and out of mutual funds. So when individuals are making decisions, are they choosing to hold risky mutual funds or safe mutual funds? And how does that vary over the year? And this study is distinct from all the ones I've discussed before because now we're looking at, at the choices people make about quantities of funds to hold. So the, the study of stock returns and treasury returns was looking at, you know, rate of change in prices. But here we're looking at in individuals deciding how much of their own money are they going to put into these investment products. So that's a, a unique feature of the study. We're going to look at flows in and out of these extreme categories of mutual funds, the riskiest and the safest. And we, what we find is that when it's the seasons that individuals are more risk averse, Investors are, are not putting money into the risky categories of mutual funds. In fact, they're drawing funds out of those risky categories. And simultaneously, they're pushing money into the safest categories of mutual funds. And then, you know, push the clock forward a few months and daylight rebounds, moves kind of revert to their previous levels of, um, you know, less depression, and risk aversion reverts to its previous level as well and these patterns in the flows reverse. So these are huge effects economically, amounting to billions and billions of dollars, and they're statistically significant and robust to controlling for all kinds of different phenomena we could consider. The primary results were done on data in the US, but we found when we look at data in Canada, where of course we're at a higher latitude, the effects become stronger. And when we look at uh, mutual fund flows in Australia, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, everything is offset by six months, just as are the seasons. So that, um, that is sort of the synopsis of the work that I've done on this topic. There's been a building of constellation of evidence from other researchers. Um, some of these studies are done by me, but a lot of them are done by others, uh, looking at just different facets of markets and um, what kind of evidence might emerge from those other markets. So uh, work looking at analyst earnings forecasts, those seem to vary seasonally. So when analysts are making a forecast of firm earnings, those forecasts seem to have a seasonal component to them that seems to be linked to the emotions being experienced by the analysts themselves. Uh, real estate investment trusts have a um, seasonal component that seems related to this phenomenon, stock market volatility, um, a lot of different things going on. Bid ask spreads is some work that my co-authors and I are looking at right now where we're, we're thinking about market makers sort of um, who help you know, facilitate the trading of stocks, what is going on with their moods, and does it influence the difference in the bid and the ask price that they're setting for the particular securities that they're responsible for. So um, lots of other work going on. Um, the bottom line is, you know, we've really attempted to build a constellation of research, um, you know, not just kind of uh, document something and then move on, 
but respond to skeptics and people who maybe um, need more convincing um, by looking at other ways of testing the hypothesis. You know, is, is the hypothesis we put forward really um, robust to uh, studying other types of markets, other types of securities, looking not just at returns, but also at flows of investor capitals, you know, we see it at the aggregate market. Do we also see it in individual level decisions? At each of these points, it's possible to find evidence that refutes the underlying hypothesis. Um, and yet, seemingly, every stone we turn over, we, we continue to find evidence that's consistent with this underlying hypothesis regarding the influence of emotions on financial decision making and financial markets overall. So, just if I could wrap up with a, a citation to Mark Twain um, and his sage investing advice. So writing in Puddinghead Wilson's calendar, Mark Twain famously said, October, this is one of the peculiarly dangerous months to speculate in stocks. It's as if he, you know, had a vision and, and um, you know, had a crystal ball. He could see our, our research before we had, had even envisioned it. Um, and if I were selective, I would stop and end his quote right here. But of course, he went on famously to say as well that the other dangerous months are, you know, every other month of the year. So be careful out there. October is dangerous, but so are all the other months of the year. Um, markets are risky. Um, and, you know, that's basically what I have to tell you today about the influence of emotions on financial markets. And it's always nice to end with a little cartoon. But uh, I thank you all for your time and your interest in this topic. Uh, doing behavioral research is exciting. You never know what you're going to find. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to be creative and um, work in a multidisciplinary setting to draw on insights from a whole bunch of different fields. And I've really enjoyed it. And I look forward to your questions as well, if you have any. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we have had a lot of uh, questions, actually. Um, <clears throat> and I'll try to speak up. I know that uh, other people have, people have said something. <coughs> um, so here's a first question. Um, do you think that your findings on the influence of seasonality could translate into general saving behaviors as well? Um, and this individual said that uh, she would hazard a guess that risk aversion wouldn't be as prevalent. Um, but would be curious about kind of your thoughts on this. Yeah, that's a good question. And I would sort of point to the results we saw in the study looking at treasury bond returns, which I think gives us a little insight into savings because of course people put money in, in treasury bonds when they're, they're more inclined to save as opposed to putting money into stocks when they're willing to face a little bit of risk of capital loss. So investing in bonds is more geared towards capital preservation. And so if I were to hazard a guess, I would say that, you know, to the extent there's any seasonality in saving behavior, people are more inclined to save during the periods of time when we've shown they're more risk averse. So, you know, I've, I've been a big proponent, you know, when you see mutual fund advertising, for example, um, you know, I think it should be kind of tailored to the seasons. So when, um, 401k season in the U.S. or RSP season in Canada comes around, you know, the, the mutual fund companies are advertising all their bond funds. Um, well, that's actually the time of year, the spring, when people are feeling more risk inclined. They're more willing to take chances. So it might make more sense to advertise kind of the stock funds during that time of the year and, you know, go back in time six months or fast forward six months to the spring or search of it to the fall. And yeah, I'm still getting used to this mouth. And in, in the fall, people are, of course, more risk averse. We shouldn't be advertising the risky funds that time of year. That's the time of year to be promoting savings. Um, now, of course, we want to promote savings all year. We just want to make sure that we're, we're tailoring the messages to, to match the preferences um, to the best that we're able. Um, so I, I think that it's definitely plausible, coming back to the original question, that there is seasonality in willingness to save, and it's important uh, to be aware of that. Great. Um, so there are a few actually other questions about um, 
just general emotions uh, and how that might impact risk aversion. Uh, so one, one question is um, how sad uh, might be different from the effect of sadness among healthy people. Um, so kind of more of an individual level uh, analysis um, and a few other ones about uh, testosterone levels and how that might influence uh, emotions and how that might influence uh, risk aversion techniques. So I get our risk aversion uh, preferences. Um, so just kind of maybe how might uh, sadness be uh, among healthy people be different uh, from sad um, when you think about risk aversion preferences? Absolutely. So, you know, in the studies that, that I just discussed, we're really looking at, um, in the extreme, depression, serious seasonal depression, and at the more moderate level, kind of um, seasonality in, in being blue. Um, I think of those as kind of pervasive, you know, long-standing emotional influences. At a more high-frequency level, you know, on an on a day-to-day -day basis, we all have perturbations in our mood. You know, we might be feeling more buoyant sometimes and a little bit more despondent other times. These studies really look at those more long-lasting mood traits, um, which all of us experience to some extent, I would say, is an upshot of, of the research. Um, to look at the more high-frequency kind of intraday level of um, emotional experience, that's a little beyond the scope of the work that I've spoken about today, but the research by people like Jennifer Lerner at Harvard, so I mentioned in the context of that um, endowment effect paper, you know, she's done some cool work where she induces emotions and and she does find effects. Now, she hasn't looked at, um, at saving necessarily um, in the study that I mentioned, she was looking at the endowment effect, but it's completely plausible that our, our intraday kind of mood effects would translate into the kind of financial decisions that we're making. And this is why, you know, I'm always advocating whenever you're feeling anything other than kind of baseline, it's just a bad time to be making economic decisions. So, you know, whenever your life is turbulent or markets are doing crazy things, that's a good time for a time out. Not a good time to be making decisions about, like, selling all of this and buying all of that. Like, no, no, don't make important decisions anytime emotions are flaring. So I think that's, you know, um, a great, great question that um, highlights that important advice. And then uh, the second set of questions asking about testosterone. This is so timely. So at um, the University of Western Ontario, Amos Nadler, um, he's an assistant professor there, and he's doing work with people at other institutions, inclu including people at um, Claremont Graduate University in California. They are studying testosterone. So they are taking people in the lab, and they're putting gel on these people, and nobody knows the researcher is blind to the, to the question, and the, the participant is blind. They don't know whether the gel has testosterone in it or whether it's just a placebo gel. And they put these people in a trading room together, and they get them to, to operate in a market sort of condition, um, and they find that the testosterone definitely has an effect. So testosterone, um, if I can recall the study correctly, um, you know, it's leading to sort of more extreme bubbles in markets, for example. People are acting more aggressively, taking more risks. And, you know, it makes sense because our, our hormones are so closely linked to our emotions. It's really the building blocks of who we are as humans. And so as we tinker with those building blocks, you know, we're changing our emotions. And, of course, we're changing the way we make financial decisions. So it's, it's so interesting. And if I could add something to that, um, just really cutting-edge stuff that's going on in neuroeconomics, People are also studying the genetics of financial risk-taking. So the idea that, you know, our, our, our gene makeup could actually help predetermine the kinds of, of decisions that we're going to make in financial context. Not that it's the whole picture. Lots of things about our upbringing and our education are going to influence how we make financial decisions. But, but you know, neurologists, neuroscientists are finding that there are these genetic markers that might predispose us to taking financial risk. And this is really cool sci-fi stuff that uh, sort of blows my mind. Very cool. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see what the results are from, uh, from a lot of those studies. Um, here's another question. Um, so this is kind of more about 
the role of expertise in uh, in in these studies. Um, so one one participant asks, um, can we expect professional fund managers to be less susceptible to such seasonal variation uh, than common individuals as they have better know-how and experience? Um, so maybe the role of expertise here is maybe a, a moderator. Yeah. Uh. I don't want to burst anybody's bubbles, but um, you know, financial professionals are human too, and they're they're prone to be susceptible to these sorts of emotional influences as well. So, um, you know, common wisdom on the street is that these professionals are supposed to be immune, but evidence is rolling in that that financial professionals are also prone to some behavioral biases as well. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't want to rely on them for anything, um, but we just want to be aware that they're human, too. They're not, they're not completely impervious to being humans. They're literally not robots. Um, some work I have on the go, it's very preliminary, but I'm doing some work uh, with Hal Hirschfield at UCLA, and we're sort of examining whether, you know, maybe financial professionals can, put a, can sort of put their emotions aside more so when they're making decisions for other people than when they're making their own financial decisions. That might be um, a possibility. It's too early to really say whether that's the case, but it, it, could, um, it could lend some reassurance to people who are, are relying on financial advisors. I mean, certainly um, that's my casual impression that, that people do seem to be more um, level-headed about those kind of delegated decisions, that they're, they're being employed by others to make um, those decisions than they are for, for their own portfolio allocation decisions. So very much a uh, question undergoing scrutiny right now. So good question. Great. Um, and I think this will be uh, our last question here. Um, so this is a little bit uh, kind of a more setting specific question. Uh, so one of the participants says uh, that she works in humanitarian assistance in a setting where people experience scarcity mentality effects. Um, so how might, can maybe scarcity mentality impact uh, risk aversion preferences in, in, in these sorts of scenarios? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I think this gets into sort of the evolutionary and biological underpinnings of taking risk. And I've thought about this a little bit in the context of my research because, you know, what, what, what makes us have differing, differing risk preferences with the seasons, you know? Um, so, for example, if, if I think back to, like, our, our caveman, you know, um, forefathers and foremothers, you know, they had to make decisions about, about um, gathering resources in preparation for the tough seasons. You know, before they um, became agrarian societies, you know, they were migrating and whatnot, they had to make decisions that would be likely to preserve their own lives and the lives of their their, their offspring, you know, they, they needed to um, be more conservative in those months of scarcity, and they had to plan ahead for those months of scarcity. So, you know, by taking more chances in the abundant seasons when daylight is plentiful and the temperature is warm, they could go out there, take chances on, on accumulating resources. If it didn't work out this time, they could take more chances tomorrow, build up the resources they needed to make it through the winter, and in the winter, they could become more conservative, you know, um, contend with the scarcity if they had planned for it properly. Um, and, you know, I, I think that might drive a lot of what we see today in terms of the seasonality of risk preferences. Of course, we don't need to worry so much about access to resources because we've developed all these international markets and supermarkets and, and uh, storage abilities and whatnot. But, but the underlying human drive still determines the way we act, and um, so that's how I think scarcity maybe plays a role. I'm not sure if that quite answers the question, but that's kind of the way I've been thinking about it myself. Great. Um, I, I, I lied. Uh, we actually have one more person to ask a question. Um, I okay. think I've gotten at least one uh, question per participant that asked one. Um, so the last question uh, for uh, at this point, uh, is uh, one participant is asking, have you mapped other factors like productivity against seasonal patterns? Um, and specifically, she's wondering if people have more bandwidth when there are more daylight hours, um, which might predispose them to making riskier or more aggressive investments. So maybe 
a little bit more about kind of alternative or specific mechanisms that are that are driving um, productivity. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, that's a very insightful question and one that I've not thought about a lot. But I will say this happens often when I present my work. Somebody will say, "Hey, could could this be a mechanism? Or have you tested that particular facet of markets?" And generally, that's the way I get new co-authors. So you, if you think back to my very first slide, it had all those lists of, of names. Those are generally people who ask me questions just like this one. And then we put our heads together and we start investigating, you know, is productivity a partial determinant of what we're, we're looking at here? You know, does bandwidth vary seasonally? I honestly have not examined that question. Um, you know, I think it relates closely to what we see in terms of um, the drivers of phenomena like herding, um, you know, when I think back again to like our, our um, ancestors and the fact that they lived in much simpler times in small villages, they knew everybody that they interacted with, they knew who the town liar was or, you know, who always would tell the truth, who they could trust, who they couldn't. So easy to interpret information in that setting. And today we have, you know, not just TV news anchors and newspaper reporters, but all these random eggs on Twitter, you know, generating fake news. It's so difficult to interpret. And um, so I think questioning um, just how we disseminate all this abundance of information we have and how that influences our productivity and whether our bandwidth varies with the seasons, these are really deep questions that, uh, yeah, make me think. So thanks for that. Great. Uh, and I, I guess that concludes the Q&A. Um, and we'd like to thank uh, Lisha for leading our webinar and uh, answering all these questions today. Um, full recording of the webinar will be available at our website uh, by clicking the side tab labeled events and then clicking the sub tab labeled bear webinar series. Uh, our next webinar will be uh, May 9th. It will be our last webinar of the academic year. Uh, and we will hear from Marcy McLean McKay, who is a senior research and policy officer at Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. Uh, it, promising, it promises to be an interesting discussion, and we hope that you all can join us then. Um, but for now, thank you so much for attending, and thank you again, Lisa. Um, you can now exit this webinar uh, by closing your WebEx screen. Thanks. Thanks.